Dallas. I don't feel too well. Hello, everyone. This is Fina from Reveal and Light. Welcome to my new series, Dictate, Dissect, and Discuss, which I have charmingly decided to refer to as Triple D. And in this series, we are going to be covering political, economic, social, psychological, philosophical, articles, book excerpts, and journals from modern day thinkers and writers. <clears throat> in this series, as you can see displayed, I will have the PDF of what I'm going to be reading to you displayed on the screen. As you can see, I have highlighted and numbered the paragraphs and sections that I feel are most important for our purposes in learning and understanding the article in greater detail. This is to give you a cursory summary of the article and its points. I will also have notes that I will be reading from during this presentation, and I will make those downloadable at the end in the description, and this PDF that I am reading, for example, today, our article will be Michael Parenti's Rulers of the Planet, Why U.S. Leaders Intervene Everywhere, and I will have that PDF available in the description for download with my highlights. You don't necessarily need to watch the video to understand and comprehend what's going on since I will be reading it, but you can if you'd like to. But you may also treat this as a podcast or an audiobook and simply just listen. Without further ado, let's get into it. This is Michael Parenti's Rulers of the Planet, Why U.S. Leaders Intervene Everywhere. us maintain that the overriding purpose of U.S. global interventionism is to promote the interests of transnational corporations and make the world safe for free market capitalism and imperialism. Washington policymakers claim that intervention is propelled by an intent to bring democracy to other peoples, maintain peace and stability in various regions, protect weaker nations from aggressors, defend U.S. national security, fight terrorism, protect human rights, oppose tyranny, prevent genocide, and the like. The crux of the argument is that Washington's interventionist policies are illegitimate, manipulative, and underhanded. The U.S. foreign policy created by Washington's policymakers is nothing but hegemony and imperialism on a global scale. We must see this for what it really is if we are to be critical of U.S. foreign policy. We can analyze its numerous interventions in world politics and conflicts to observe its lies about promoting freedom, peace, and democracy. And I should mention quickly before we get any further that this series is not designed for people who don't have a familiarity with these terms already. So if you don't know what imperialism is, if you don't know what hegemony means, then I would uh, look up those terms first, maybe introduce yourself to politics, political economy, etc., and then come back to this because these terms are not going to be explained in too much length and the series already presupposes that the listener has some basic familiarity with these kinds of terms. Anyway... A global military empire. Two. The U.S.'s armed planetary force of military equipment and people include about half a million troops stationed at over 395 major bases and hundreds of minor installations in 35 foreign countries, more than 8,000 strategic nuclear weapons and 22,000 tactical ones, a naval strike force greater in total tonnage and firepower than all the other navies of the world combined, consisting of military cruisers, nuclear submarines, nuclear aircraft carriers, and destroyers that sail every ocean and make port at every continent. With only 5% of the Earth's population, the United States expends more military funds than all the other major powers combined. 
The U.S. maintains the world's largest armed forces globally, spending a disproportionate amount of money on upkeep of its global outposts of nuclear weapons carriers, missiles, aircraft, submarines, etc. Comprising only 5% of the world's population, the U.S. spends more on defense than all major powers combined. Please keep these statistics in mind for later. Three. Worldwide, U.S. arms sales to cooperative capitalist nations rose to $36.9 billion in 2000, up from $34 billion in 1999. In addition to sales, since World War II, the U.S. government has given some $240 billion in military aid to train, equip, and subsidize some 2.3 million troops and internal security forces in more than 80 countries. The purpose being not to defend these nations from outside invasion, but to protect ruling oligarchs and multinational corporate investors from the dangers of domestic anti-capitalist insurgency. Anti-capitalist insurgencies are swiftly, or not so swiftly depending on the conflict, put down with the aid of the U.S.'s expertly trained military extensions in more than 80 countries worldwide. This constant need to control the global narrative and not only know who's fighting who, but where they are doing it, what technology they have, and how it can benefit the U.S.'s financial capital is problematic on all counts. Being involved in so many conflicts either directly or by proxy, as with Vietnam and Korea during the Cold War, is a rather bloody way of maintaining hard power, opposed to soft power, which I will discuss later, and making sure its allies are also well suited to keeping their capitalist interests in check. So their allies being, say for instance, the UK, France, people in NATO, maybe Saudi Arabia, Japan, it all depends. This next section is a great example. By observing that, with few exceptions, there is no evidence suggesting that these various regimes have ever been threatened by attack from neighboring countries, b. Just about all these friendly regimes have supported economic systems that are subserviently integrated into a global system of transnational corporate domination, open to foreign penetration on terms that are singularly favorable to transnational investors, c. There is a great deal of evidence that the U.S. supported military and security forces and death squads in these various countries have been repeatedly used to destroy popular reformist movements and insurgencies that advocate some kind of egalitarian redistributive policies within their own countries. Supporting the right. 5. To explicate the politico-economic content of leftist governments and movements is to reveal their egalitarian and usually democratic goals, making it much harder to demonize them. If both domestic and international audiences knew what leftists actually advocate for, for a, on a broader scale, sans efforts to smother them in unfavorable buzzwords, then it would be much harder to put down a group of people simply calling for all people to have safe and affordable access to health care, wages they deserve without scalping, affordable or free housing, etc. The reason demonization works so well is because we've been conditioned to see everything through a lens of greed and selfishness, as the capitalists do, which works out well for fascistic countries that want to use that rhetoric to stir up animosity and continue giving money to the wealthy with ambivalent or positive approval from their citizenry. Continuation In almost every country, including our own, brightest groups, parties, or governments pursue tax and spending programs, wage and investment practices, methods of police and military control, and deregulation and privatization policies that primarily benefit those who receive the bulk of their income from investments and property at the expense of those who live off wages, salaries, fees, and pensions. 
Number six, which I will read as an example. U.S. leaders have supported some of the most notorious right-wing autocracies in history, governments that have tortured, killed, or otherwise maltreated large numbers of their citizens because of their dissenting political views, as in Turkey, Zaire, Chad, Pakistan, Morocco, Indonesia, Honduras, Peru, Colombia, Argentina, El Salvador, Guatemala, Haiti, the Philippines, Cuba, under Batista, Nicaragua, under Somoza, Iran, under the Shah, and Portugal, under Salazar. These are all examples of the U.S. leading insurgencies and in countries in order to install right-wing dictators and autocrats in order to meet their own needs instead of meeting the country's needs. Because, as we all know, the U.S. has a very long and storied history in regime change and coups. Seven. In Italy, as long as the Communist Party had imposing strength in Parliament and with the labor unions, U.S. policymakers worked with the centrist alternatives, such as the Christian Democrats and the anti-communist Italian Socialist Party. Side note, if you ever see an organization that's anti-communist using the word socialist in their name, please note that this is an effort to lure leftists into their party where they will then be discriminated against, not get the policies that they want to see, or they will actively be harassed or possibly jailed or killed. This was done by the Nazis in Germany when their party was named the National Socialist Party, the NSP. To continue, with communism in decline by the 1990s, U.S. leaders began to lend more open encouragement to extreme rightist forces. In 1994 and again in 2001, national elections were won by the National Alliance, a coalition of neo-fascists ultra-conservatives and northern separatists headed by media tycoon Silvio Berlusconi. The alliance played on resentments regarding unemployment, taxes, and immigration. It attempted to convince people that government was the enemy, especially its social service sector. At the same time, it worked to strengthen the repressive capacities of the state and divide the working class against itself by instigating antagonisms between the resident population and immigrants, all the while preaching the virtues of the free market and pursuing tax and spending measures that redistributed income upward. The CIA supported anti-communists in Italy using both overtly bloody and covertly sneaky ways. When communism was on the upswing, the U.S. used softer approaches such as throwing their weight behind the Christian Democrats, a centrist religious party. Other times, when Silvio Berlusconi, and yes, if you know who he is, it is indeed that guy, <laughs> came to power with the alliance, they didn't make a peep as he stirred up trouble using anti-immigrant rhetoric to account for Italy's economic woes. All the while, millionaires kept seeing their pockets fatten up as tax policies increased their bottom line. According to Berlusconi, Government social services were serving the interests of those who didn't deserve them, and government needed to stay out of everyone's business so the free market could make us all freer by limiting key social services and leaving ordinary citizens out in the cold with no alternatives or safety nets. Sound familiar? Opposing the left. Number eight. The United States has successfully subverted reformist and leftist governments by financing and controlling their internal security units and intelligence agencies, providing them with counterinsurgency technology, including instruments of torture, imposing crippling economic sanctions, IMF austerity programs, bribing political leaders, military leaders, and other key players, inciting retrograde ethnic separatists and supremacists within the country subverting their democratic and popular organizations, rigging their elections, financing collaborationist political parties, labor unions, 
academic researchers, journalists, research groups, non-governmental organizations or NGOs, and various media. A word on the IMF, by the way. Imperialism through debt is a very real issue. Many countries in the Global South have become sucked into a perpetual cycle of poverty and debt because they have privatized large swaths of their industries and sold them off to foreign governments who reap the benefits of their labor markets. Export heavy and selling mostly cash crops will do that. High interest rates will do that as well. Nine, U.S. leaders profess a dedication to democracy, yet over the past five decades, democratically elected reformist governments, guilty of introducing redistributive programs in Guatemala, Guyana, the Dominican Republic, Brazil, Chile, Uruguay, Syria, Indonesia under Sukarno, Greece, Cyprus, Argentina, Bolivia, Haiti, the Congo, and numerous other nations were overthrown by their respective military forces and funded and advised by the United States. In many cases, the attacks were directed at soft targets such as schools, farm cooperatives, health clinics, and whole villages. US-NATO forces delivered round-the-clock terrorist bombings upon Yugoslavia for two and a half months in 1999 targeting housing projects, private homes, hospitals, schools, state-owned factories, radio and television stations, government-owned hotels, municipal power stations, water supply systems, and bridges, along with hundreds of other non-military targets at great loss to civilian life. Time and time again, we can see that if a country isn't participating in supply-side economics with market liberalization or austerity politics dictated by the IMF, World Bank, or WTO, the World Trade Organization, then they get corrected by the US and other nations. It's also a well-known strategy to target places that aren't exactly combat-related or have combat-ready people to demoralize the populace and show you mean business. It's also easier to take out the medics first because they're non-combatants that provide an essential service to enemy soldiers during wartime. And this is pretty disgusting. Ten. The September 2001 terrorist attacks against the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, causing a great loss of innocent lives, provided U.S. leaders with the perfect excuse to intensify their policies of armed intervention, surveillance and repression, and reactionary rollback of domestic public services, all in the name of national security. Many have decried the Patriot Act, including myself, as an unjust use of domestic repression and surveillance that harms the ordinary citizen far more than it does any potential terrorist. Exceptions that prove the rule. 11. The goal is the third worldization of the entire world, including Europe and North America, a world in which capital rules supreme with no public sector services, no labor unions to speak of, no prosperous, literate, effectively organized working class with rising expectations, no pension funds or environmental, consumer, and occupational protections, or medical plans, or any of the other insufferable things that cut into profit rates. In such, <clears throat> in such instances, Washington's support has been dictated by temporary expediencies or the promise, as such in the case of China, that the country is moving towards incorporation and into the global capitalist system. I read both of these together, and now I will read the notes to both of them. The first one is just a nice summation of what we read so far. And the second one, 
proves that China is not and has not been communist, socialist, or even social democratic for many, many years. We can see that China does not have worker-owned control of the means of production, it has a large amount of its industries privatized, and it regularly engages in collaboration with the global capitalist system. If anyone tells you China is communist, they're clearly LARPing. After the Counter-Revolution 13. The newly installed private market govern governments in Eastern Europe, under the strong direction of Western policymakers, eliminated price controls and subsidies for food, housing, transportation, clothing, and utilities. They cut back on medical benefits and support for public education. They abolished job guarantees, public employment programs, and workplace benefits. They forbade workplace political activities by labor unions. They have been selling off publicly owned lands, factories, and news media at bargain prices to rich corporate investors. Numerous other industries have been simply shut down. The fundamental laws were changed from a public to private ownership system. There was a massive transfer of public capital into the coffers of private owners. Throughout the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, reforms brought severe economic recession and high unemployment. A sharp increase in crime, homelessness, beggary, suicide, drug addiction, and prostitution. A dramatic drop in educational and literacy standards, serious deterioration in healthcare and all other pu public services, and skyrocketing infant mortality and plummeting life expectancy rates. Tragically, shock therapy did not work for the newly christened Russian Federation. Turns out when you take away someone's social safety nets like workers' benefits, unions, food programs, state-sponsored child care, etc., they tend to see worse health outcomes and spikes in cases of depression and suicide. Now I'm not going to lionize the USSR. It had its fair share of problems and I'm not a tanky by any means. But it must be said that the U.S. did not help matters by being one of the architects of its economic recession and collapse while making its population fall into drug addiction and alcoholism as a result of widespread neglect and poverty. Fourteen. We can conclude something about the intent of the U.S. invasion by noting how the U.S. counter-revolutionary occupation put an immediate end to almost all these government-sponsored programs. In the years that followed, unemployment in Granada reached new heights and poverty new depths. Domestic cooperatives were suppressed or starved out. Farm families were displaced to make way for golf courses, and the corporate-controlled tourist industry boomed. Granada was once more firmly bound to the privatized free market world, once again safely third worldized. This paragraph is in reference to the paragraph above. How the US intervened in Granada after the new jewel revolutions government got underway, and that government gave free foodstuffs, home improvement, grade school and secondary occasion were made free, etc. And this is very similar to the Russian example above. Rolling back on social programs will always lead to worse outcomes for a population. Third worldization, as Parenti terms it, has caused a nation with a once healthy and robust socio-political infrastructure to crumble sideways under the duress of burgeoning capitalist invasion and recreation. Consistent Inconsistencies 15. China has opened itself to private capital and free market reforms, including enterprise zones, 
wherein Western investors can super exploit the country's huge and cheap labor supply with no worry about wage and occupation standards or other restrictive regulations. Cuba has so far refused to go down that road. This is a double standard. If you comply with our standards, you will be judged less harshly than if you continue to shake your fist at us and tell us to go screw ourselves. China, a source of extre extremely cheap and exploitable labor, has allied itself with Western imperialist superpowers to bolster its status on the world economic stage and gain access to relative ease in trading. Cuba hasn't bent to this pressure and spurns US economic interests so it is judged harshly, and their socialism is worse than China's socialism. Even the US knows how pink China really is. Sixteen. Generally, refugees from anti-capitalist countries like Cuba are readily categorized as victims of political oppression and allowed entry while those fleeing from brutal pro-capitalist military dictatorships like Haiti during the 1980s are sent back, often to face incarceration or extermination. During the 1980s, refugees from right-wing client states like El Salvador and Guatemala had a hard time getting into the United States, while refugees from Nicaragua, of the same Latino stock as the Salvadorans and Guatemalans, had relatively no trouble because they were considered to be fleeing a communistic Sandinista government. It certainly matters why and who you're fleeing from. It would look bad on US television and in US news media to see a country's people fleeing to the US when they know the US is supposedly trying to be the good guy in the equation. I would also argue that xenophobia of course plays a part in this because no matter where you're from, American immigrant policy is unfriendly. Freeing from a bloody socialist coup will certainly net you more sympathy points to frame it as such from people who aren't in the know. This is an example of soft power in media and journalism, swaying the public's opinion of another country by who you see as being good refugees trying to flee persecution and destruction versus bad refugees coming to bring communist brutality and crime to our streets. When words speak louder than actions. 17. In 1990, General Gray, commandant of the U.S. Marines, observed that the United States must have, quote, unimpeded access end quote, to, quote, established and developing economic markets throughout the world, end quote. This is simply just saying the quiet part out loud. 18. But when it becomes a barrier to an untrammeled capitalism, democracy runs into trouble. Far from being wedded to each other, capitalism and democracy are often on a fatal collision course. I think this is the part a lot of free market neoliberals and libertarians don't seem to connect together. When push comes to shove, democracy will fold to capitalist interests in the financial capital power surge every time. Why do things the diplomatic and business-like way when freedom can't cut it and you run into roadblocks? Democracy says, we all get a shake of the stick, while capitalism instead counteracts with I bought this big stick to beat you over the head with if we can't come to an amicable agreement on how you'll run your economy. Nineteen. As early as 1984, the Reagan administration issued U.S. National Security Decision Directive 133, United States Policy Towards Yugoslavia, labeled a Secret Sensitive. It followed closely the objectives laid out in an earlier directive aimed at Eastern Europe, one that called for a quiet revolution to overthrow communist governments while reintegrating the countries of Eastern Europe into the orbit of the world capitalist market. The economic reforms pressed upon Yugoslavia by the IMF and other foreign creditors 
mandated that all socially owned firms and all worker managed production units be transferred into private capitalist enterprises. More talk about the IMF and their disastrous economic reform policies for recently crashed out nations. Creditors took slices of Yugoslavia's now broken up national pie and caused the entire public sector to bleed capital like no tomorrow, reinforcing the laborious struggle between workers and those who want to work them to the bone. And as we all know, removing these people from their jobs only to shrink the economy because of mass selling of worker-owned businesses to corporations leaves them with no job, no property to make money off of, and by extension, no money. Conspiracy, Incompetence, and Inertia 20. In 1986, it was discovered that the Reagan administration was running a covert operation to bypass Congress and the law, using funds from secret arms sales to Iran to finance counter-revolutionary mercenaries, the Contras in Nicaragua, and probably GOP electoral campaigns at home. President Reagan admitted full knowledge of the arms sales but claimed that he had no idea what happened to the money. He was asking us to believe that these operations were being conducted by subordinates, including his very own national security advisor, without being cleared by him. Reagan publicly criticized staff and himself for his slipshod managerial style and lack of administrative control over his staff. His admission of incompetence was eagerly embraced by various analysts and pundits who preferred to see their leaders as suffering from innocent ignorance rather than deliberate deception. Subsequent testimony by his subordinates, however, revealed that Reagan was not as dumb as he was pretending to be and that he had played an active and deciding role in the entire Iran-Contra affair. One of my favorite examples of a president doing an oopsie, I made a little mistake and funded insurgencies with money I got from clandestine deals. Haha, <laughs> it's all good. I'm just a moron. It's much more marketable to capital to assume things just go wrong sometimes, that we couldn't have foreseen X, Y, and Z, and that we should just throw our hands up and move on. Reagan funded the Contras in Nicaragua, a sitting president with access to literally all the means to do so, from the money he made in Iran from arms sales, and we're just supposed to believe all the people hand-waving it as a conspiracy. I believe there's an article we're going to read about the left's conspiracy phobia. I'm not a big conspiracy person by a mile because, and now I'm reinforcing what I just tried to invert, most of it is made by hacks, but stuff like this is why Peter Dale Scott, another person we'll read in the future, wrote about when he coined the term deep politics. Also, this isn't a note, but I wanted to insert this quote from Anthony Bourdain about Kissinger since he's mentioned further down the page. Twenty-one. If policymakers have nothing to hide, why do they hide so much? An estimated 21,500 U.S. government documents are classified every workday of the year. Some of these materials eventually come to light 30 or 40 years later and can still be quite revealing. We've seen a real uptick in calls for transparency from our national government in recent years open source software, FOSS slash FLOSS, etc. also reflect a similar ethos in technology. All in all, quite literally everyone has rallied around the point of, you need to stop being sneaky and committing crimes and at least show us what you're doing because declassified documents from 40 years ago can prosecute you in modern day because you'll be dead. This allows elected officials to skate by and in all likelihood never face the consequences of their actions. Great example? Look no further than COINTELPRO. The 
the other variable's argument. 22. Some people might complain that the analysis presented herein is simplistic and insufficiently nuanced because it ascribes all events to purely economic and class motives while ignoring other variables like geopolitics, culture, ethnicity, nationalism, ideology, morality, and leadership psychology. It is a passion among certain academics to claim authorship to nuanced views. These views often turn out to be so much polished evasion whose primary function is to deny the existence of a material and economic base to any social conflict. Furthermore, what is more simplistic and mechanistic than to assume, without benefit of empirical investigation, that a proliferation of variables ipso facto brings us closer to the truth? Such a question should be settled by empirical investigation rather than fiat. The existence of other variables such as nationalism, militarism, the search for national security, and the pursuit of power and hegemonic dominance neither compels us to dismiss economic realities nor to treat these other variables as insulated from class interests. Thus, to argue that U.S. leaders intervene in one or another region not because of economic considerations but for strategic reasons may sound to some like a more nuanced view, but in most cases, Empirical examination shows that the desire to secure or extend U.S. strategic power is impelled at least in part by a desire to stabilize the area along lines that are favorable to politico-economic elite interest, which is usually why the region becomes a focus of concern in the first place. I highlighted this paragraph more so to showcase the critique Parenti brings forth. Often, and I'm guilty of this myself, we scrape around for reasons for something and come up with a bunch of intersectional points that can guide us, in a manner of speaking, closer to our goal of figuring out what the truth is. However, sometimes we become muddled and honestly, Occam's razor can really help a struggling reader trying to figure out the truth, if there even is one. And finally, 23. The point is not that nations act imperialistically for purely material motives, but that the ideological and psychic motives, embraced with varying degrees of sincerity by individual policymakers, unfailingly serves the overall system sustaining material interest of particular class. Another great summary of what we've learned. Parenti concludes his writing by getting to the heart of this imperialistic crisis of power we're constantly having to see unfold before our very eyes. The meat of his statement is this. No matter the psychological or ideological bent of a policymaker or the president or their cabinet, they all serve the dominant and unimpeachable interest of capital and will use those subservient notions of militarism, nationalism, democracy heralding, etc., to execute those economic and class interests. As long as international capital is flowing into the hands and pockets of those that promote plutocracy in all forms, then the war machine has done its job. Land, natural resources, labor, everything is up for grabs in the global casino. Socialist, communist, nationalist regimes will fall to the U.S.'s hands because they are simply not following the blueprint for capital accumulation and distribution into the financial stock market. As long as there are nation servants and nation masters, the entire world will continue to undergo third worldization. And that's it for today. Thank you so much for listening to me read dictate, dissect, and discuss this article. Please excuse any stuttering or any errors because this is actually my first time doing something similar to this and I hope in future episodes I can improve and make things even more smooth for you. As I said before, both of these, my notes and my highlighted text, 
will be available for download and I will put the links in the description. Thank you very much and I hope to see you again soon. Bye bye. Thank you.